Welcome back, everyone. It's good to see you uh, for another episode of the AFA podcast. Uh, of course, I'm Mr. Macklin. Um, and with me today is Dr. David M. Moffitt. Uh, welcome, Dr. Moffitt. Uh, it's good to be here. Thanks. So I know many of our audience will not know who Dr. Moffitt is. I do, however, because we met in college many, many years ago. I think first through our um, respective girlfriends who were friends yeah. with each other, and they later became our respective wives. Um, and uh, But not only that, Dr. Moffat and I were also history majors uh, together and lived uh, on, the same, at, uh, on the same floor of venerable Hicks Hall uh, at, uh, at Grove City in the uh, early to mid-90s. Um, many years ago. We've stayed friends ever since then. And um, I thought it would be great, Dr. Moffat, uh, for us to talk about some of our educational experiences and the things that really shaped us as thinkers. But before we get into that, our audience should know, you are a graduate of Trinity Evangelical Divinity School with a Master's of Divinity there. You then went on to Duke University and we're still friends, even so, <laughs> where you got a uh, THM and then a PhD. Um, you later went on to teach at Campbell University uh, Divinity School and now are currently a um, reader in New Testament studies at St. Andrews University in Scotland, um, where, I mean, among other things, you're you, you're friends with N.T. Wright, and and all of, and I'm sure, uh, and you move in all kinds of very interesting research circles. If anybody wants to look you up, you can see the numerous articles you uh, you published. Dr. Moffat is considered one of the foremost authorities in the Book of Hebrews, and his work in the Book of Hebrews was uh, had him. Uh, he was the recipient of the very prestigious Manfred Lauschenschlager. Uh, no, wait, I got that wrong. What is it? Lautenschläger. I missed the umlaut over the A. Genau. <laughs> <laughs> Manfred Lautenschläger Award. I think That's I got it wrong right. again. In 2013, um, only one of, Dr. Rump is one of 10 selections uh, for this award, and it's an international award given for theological promise back in 2013, and that or again, was his work on Hebrews and his doctoral dissertation. Um, welcome, Dave. I'm probably going to call you Dave, even though... Yeah, no, I, I hope uh, you do. It would be too weird to... Yes. I don't want to... I mean, I shouldn't call you Mr. Mathwin, right? <laughs> uh, no, no, you should not. Um, okay. <laughs> you definitely should not. You know, Dave, before we get into this, um, you know, dealing... You know, the pandemic brings various challenges. Of course, we had no March Madness basketball tournament. Um, yeah. So I uh, did spend some time on YouTube watching some of Maryland's greatest victories. <laughs> then I transitioned to watching some of Duke's greatest defeats. No doubt you remember <laughs> Lehigh over Duke in uh, 2012 and perhaps Mercer over Duke in 2014. Yeah, yeah. But I think more memorable is all the Duke over Maryland victories that I've watched throughout my years. So. Dave, I'm, I'm sorry, you're breaking up a little. <laughs> Internet connection, it's a little weird. Yeah. Ah, whatever. We've got to move what, on. What was this about Maryland having to leave the ACC for some reason? Is that oh, so they can only actually the win more games? or? <laughs> <laughs> we left the ACC only for the most uh, honorable and um, <laughs> venerable of reasons. I believe, Dr. Moffat, it had to do with our president's desire to partner with leading research universities. I, I, it had nothing <laughs> to do with money, by the way, or the Big Ten Network, yeah, yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> well, all right. Um, now that we cleared the air of our, you know, our 20-year uh, Duke-Maryland rivalry, um, when... I, I wanted to talk about some of our professors, and what I thought would be beneficial to our community was um, to talk about kind of how we were shaped uh, as thinkers, not just, uh, shall we say, for our, you know, 
for personal revelation. But both of us had, I think we would call it more or less average sort of high school experiences. Mm -hmm. And in college, you know, we had a few professors, some of them, you know, in common, that really kind of blew the doors open for us. And I don't want this to be an endorsement necessarily of our alma mater, although again, um, you know, we, we, I think we did well there and had a great education there in many ways. Um, but an endorsement of a certain kind of education, right? And a certain kind of, we might say, method of education. Yeah. Um, yeah. I thought we might start with uh, reminiscing about, uh, briefly about our two history professors, both of whom were very spiky uh, in mm. certain ways. Uh, Dr. Barbara Aiken and Dr. David McKillop, um, sadly, they both uh, passed on. Um, but we have good memories of them. Um, yeah. So, Dave, let me share my first thought, my first memory with Dr. Aiken's class. <coughs> he was my advisor, and I was a freshman walking into Grove City. And I did. Did Dr. Aiken? Did she? Did she really scare you to death? As at least as a freshman. Uh. Yeah. She, yeah. She was scary. Uh. She also just made me really angry. <laughs> <laughs> initially, I should say initially. Initially, yeah. right. Yeah. So she's my advisor and she says, oh, you know, why don't you, here, um, here, take this 300 level, you know, early colonial America class and so forth. I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> whatever. Fine, 300 level class, I'm a freshman. You know, and then like the first book she hands out <laughs> the first day, it was something like, like colonial agrarian patterns of culture and migratory, you know, political trends from like 1673 to like 1712. And I thought <laughs> to myself, <laughs> uh, like I became a history major because I liked the Patton movie. Like what in the world <laughs> is going on? Like I have no, like, oh my gosh, she really, but, you know, I remember going home and reading that essay. I, I have no idea what's going on, no idea what to think about anything. Um, slowly but surely, you know, she wanted you to kind of start to swim, but she did not mind just, like, throwing you in the deep end and saying, mm -hmm. go for it. Uh, do you have any similar kinds of uh, experiences with Dr. Aiken? Yeah, Dr. Aiken. Um... So, you know, I, I started Grove City, uh, I came from a fairly conservative, um, fairly sheltered in some respects background. Um, I had a lot of theological background from my father, I come from a reformed tradition. Um, and, you know, one of the strengths of the reformed tradition often is the emphasis that it places on theology, systematic theology, thinking hard about the things you believe. So, you know, I came to, to my undergraduate uh, with what I thought was, you know, pretty, pretty impressive background in, <laughs> in theological thinking and, uh, should we say, a, a certain degree of arrogance. Uh, I knew what I believed and I knew I was right and everybody else was wrong. And you know, I came to undergraduate and sat under Dr. Aiken. I think I had a class with her my first semester and immediately found myself being taught by this person who clearly politically and theologically came from a radically different position than I did. Mm -hmm. And we, we sort of clashed pretty early on um, because I was – not willing to to really listen to someone and respect someone who I thought was so completely wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and just like you said, she she would throw you right into the deep end. Um, I remember at one point uh, I raised some question. I don't even remember what the question was, and she addressed me as a dumbhead in front <laughs> of the entire class. Right and. Um, and that really made me upset. Uh, 
but it also sort of challenged me to think like, okay, if I'm going to interact with this particular teacher, I'm going to have to start to have a better sense of what I'm actually talking about. Mm-hmm. And by, by throwing us into the deep end, as you said, and by being very sort of upfront with her own political views uh, and religious views, um, it, it really presented an opportunity to engage with someone with whom I knew I did not agree, uh, rather than just caricature her, you know, as someone I didn't have to engage with, but I just knew was wrong. Um, and the process of going through that was for me incredibly helpful because I discovered, lo and behold, she knew a lot more about the stuff she was talking about than I did. I'm not saying I agree with her on everything, but you know, you discover that like, people who have done the work to research intensively uh, on a subject to earn a PhD, uh, she knew what she was talking about. And I learned that I had a lot to learn. So that was, that was in one instance of um, a certain professor who, as you said, spiky, I think was the word you used, um, whose spiky way of presenting herself and personality and views uh, actually was helpful for me because I had to stop and actually rethink a lot of what I thought about people I disagreed with and suddenly discovered I needed to respect her for any number of reasons, right? But not least because she knew what she was talking about. And many of the things that she pushed us on in her classes, um, I only have come to appreciate more and more as I myself then went on and pursued graduate work uh, and and embraced the life of academic research. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, sorry, that was a bit rambly. I no, know, no, but- no, that's good. No, thank you. You know, um, I remember, you know, turning in drafts of a paper to Dr. Aiken, and it was always being, um, you know, a harrowing experience, but mm. an exciting one because she, um, so she, she would get excited about whatever you were right about or wrong about, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I remember various, uh, you know, ex- exclamatory phrases and, and big underlining, like, you know, like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, That's right. Sometimes, again, Dr. Aiken was, uh, again, hard to just put her in a box, um, but to give people an idea, you know, uh, a heavy smoker, an Episcopal reverend of a, you know, fairly, I'm guessing, more or less liberal sort of denomination, but she really got into it, and, um, right, she would, she would let fly with, like, uh, you know, well, well, golly, how do you think of that? That's... Well, I, that's that's not a bad that's not a bad point, but the word bad point <laughs> might be a little bit more like <laughs> that's uh, or how can you possibly think that? No, 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 and lots of crossing out, and she was really getting yeah. into it. Um, it was a harrowing experience, but but it meant that like yeah, you had to prepare to hand her something, um, and eventually yeah. I learned to yeah. prepare and learn to. Um, uh, I think it gave me some tougher skin. Um, the class that yeah. I think impacted us was historical research. And yep. this did so much to shape my own teaching. And, uh, of course, ad fontes in Latin means, you know, to the sources. And um, we stress a lot of primary sources in our, um, in our education. You know, I don't use a textbook. Uh, I just use primary source documents. Um, and... Uh, and even some of our, some, in some of our math classes, even some of our, some of our uh, math teachers kind of create their own thing. Anyway, talk about that historical research class. I know it was very formative for both yeah. of us in terms yeah. of our um, philosophy of learning. Uh, go ahead and yeah. comment. Well, I mean, I think what you, just to, to pick up with what you were talking about, this push, and, and I, I would say there were, there were several uh, faculty whom I think we shared, um, who really pushed or at least forced us to read primary texts at Grove City. Uh, Aiken, of course, was one, and historical research was 
was the class where basically you were allowed to come up with your own question. You went to the sources and you pursued it and shaped it. Um, you weren't, I mean, you were engaging with secondary literature, but your primary goal was to come up with your own hypothesis about a particular historical question that you were pursuing. Uh, I remember I wrote on Roger Williams and, you know, just ended up reading through several volumes of Roger Williams' own writings. Um, it was, it was fun. It was illuminating. I learned a lot about um, life in colonial America from, from these primary texts. Um, but it also was a course where she forced us to be very careful with things like documenting our sources. Uh, I remember being somewhat frustrated, not only by Dr. Aiken, but also so Dr. Hoffecker, for, for the extent to which they pushed you to get your citation format exactly right. <laughs> and to me, that just seemed like, what? why does it matter? I mean, okay. you know what sort of, right? It's, yeah, it's no. good enough, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and you're funny, the funny thing is, when I was at seminary, one of the first classes I had at seminary, I had a, a professor who was handing back our papers, um, hold up my paper, in front of the class and say, everybody needs to learn to cite like this paper. And I was like, well, I mean, that was pretty cool. But I immediately thought like, this isn't, I can't bask in this glory. This is the training <laughs> I got in my undergraduate. Like, right. This is Dr. Aiken coming through. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, of course you learn as, as you go on in acad academia that there is a kind of grammar and syntax to a uh, professional um, discourse. And that's the sort of thing. She was giving us methodology and she was also forcing us to learn some of the basic grammar of how you engage in, um, you know, for, for an undergraduate, fairly rigorous academic discourse. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing too, though, in addition to primary sources and citation, Dr. Aiken, I remember, was the, the only that I can recall, the only professor I had who required that you do research in contemporary academic journals. Mm -hmm. And that also um, became hugely important. I mean, mm -hmm. journals are where, I didn't, again, I didn't know this at the time, but uh, journals are where contemporary academic conversation is happening. Uh, you are taught when you when you publish a journal article, you are talking to your colleagues and you're trying to engage with them and critique them and correct them. And then they have the chance to do that with you. And Dr. Aiken was really the one who introduced me to that part of sort of larger academic life. Yeah. You know, um, when I think of that historical research class, I did my uh, paper on uh, Ulysses S. Grant. Again, I think that she probably would have preferred me to do it on agrarian migratory patterns in the Ohio <laughs> River Valley. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, she was like, great, do it on Ulysses S. Grant. But I remember she very specifically telling me, like, I don't want you to tell me what historians think of Grant. I want you to tell yeah. me what his, his, like, want you to tell me what his contemporaries thought of him. Tell me what you know, Longstreet thought of him, tell me what Lee thought of him, tell me what lieutenants thought of him when they wrote home about him. Like, do not bring in a single secondary source. Do not cite anything. There's enough out there. You need to write this entirely from the primary source documents at the time. And um, that was a struggle. But yeah, yeah. I, I learned a lot there too. And, um, and like you said about the journal articles, enormously aggravating for me. And I thought kind of yeah. dumb and go down into the stats and find the, oh, like, ah, oh. but, but, again, she delighted in making you uncomfortable knowing that it would be, you know, for your good in the end. And, it, yeah, exposed to different authors and different kinds of thinkers that you wouldn't find in the library shelf. Um, very important. Doctor. Absolutely. And yeah, go ahead. The, well, I was just going to say the point that you just made about taking us down into the stacks. Um, she actually did this. She actually led us on tours of the library mm -hmm. and showed us where different resources were. I learned about the existence of certain uh, research resources because she took us to the library shelves 
and actually said, here's this, here's why it's important, here's how you can use it. And um, I, uh, I don't do that here at St. Andrews, but when I was at Campbell, uh, I did that with my classes. I took them to the library, I showed them where, especially my Greek classes, um, so that they could do New Testament exegesis, I showed them where the resources were. And there were several students who thanked me for that. But again, I can't claim, I got that from Dr. Aiken, and I know how valuable it was for me, so that I didn't just show up at a library and cast about, not knowing where to even start, um, because she, she had taken the time to do that. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, um, our other history professor, Dr. McKillop, I, I taught me a particular powerful lesson that I try and impart to our students. And that was, he had us do these, I mean, I would call them book reviews or book reports, but they really weren't that. Yeah. He gave yeah. us, he would give us books, right? I'm sure you remember this. And he would yep. say, you know, read the book. And I don't want you to tell me like what you think of his ideas, at least not first, like whether you think he's right or wrong or but tell, find out what he seeks to prove, what he seeks to accomplish in this book, and then pay attention to whether or not he's accomplished it. In other words, yeah. I think Dr. McKillop, <laughs> right. yeah, he really wanted us to enter into the mind of the author first. Like, stop, don't tell me what you think. Honestly, I'm not that interested. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, tell me, if, like, learn to evaluate another person's work and take it seriously before you kind of fire off with whatever opinion you have. Um, yeah. And he exposed us too to some really interesting um, people. That's where I found out about AGP Taylor, about David mm. Lamb, um, about um, C.S. Lewis's brother's work in, on, yeah. on um, 18th century France or 17th century France. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts? What do you remember about Dr. McKillop? Yeah, no, uh, many of the things that you just mentioned um, would be things that, uh, that come to my mind as well. Um, I mean, I still, every, well, I don't know. It, since we've left Grove City, I've probably gone back two or three times to the Guns of August mm -hmm. and just oh, reread it. I mean, it's just every time I reread that book, uh, it's more, I, I find it more rich um, and interesting, but McKillop was the one who introduced me to that book and that approach to doing historical thinking, which was in a lot of ways very different from Dr. Aiken. Um, I think both of them focused us uh, on the idea that you brought up, that you should look for the thesis of the author. What are they trying to argue? Find a thesis statement and then you know, judge their work in part on the basis of how they're, they're playing that out. Um, that's, that's key to academic writing. And you know, you, <laughs> when you're in the position of uh, directing doctoral students or teaching undergraduates or teaching um, kids how to write papers, you, you see really quickly that most of us don't intuitively think in these ways. You have to be trained to think in terms of focusing yourself on a thesis statement rather than a kind of Joycean stream of consciousness <laughs> paper, which is you know, not fun for anybody to read uh, right. <laughs> and no. doesn't really argue much of anything. Yeah, I think too, it's, yeah, a, hard, it's a hard discipline, not just for my students, but for yeah. anybody, for any, anyone, you, me, still, I'm sure, you know, we both have our thoughts and opinions and so on. Everybody does. But to try and take, before you, shall we say, just react to something, to try and take another person's thoughts seriously. I mean, similar to great literature, where you have, I think C.S. Lewis had this wonderful comment, I believe, in his book, Experiment and Criticism, where he said, when you read great literature, um, it's kind of preparatory in some way to worship because you have to open up yourself to the world of another, um, to the thoughts of another, and kind of let yourself be shaped in some way, um, at least for a time, by yeah. the mind of another. Uh, and we don't like that, I think, naturally. We want to, you know, and 
of course, not complete and total openness to everything. That's that's foolishness. But um, this is something that students struggle with, that we all struggle with. Um, and Dr. McKillop helped really, I think, try and kind of beat that out of us uh, as much as as much as possible. I think that's really well put, Dave. And um, and I would totally agree. That's one of the things that I took from Grove City. Uh, and it wasn't just Aiken. It wasn't just McKillop. Um, you know, I got it from Dr. Hoffecker, uh, Dr. Trammell. These, these are ones who in particular um, had a big influence on, on the way that I approach what I do and, and how I imagine what I'm doing. Um, but I, I think an important point, um, that this is, I'm sorry, this is a bit of a soapbox, but mm -hmm. Dr. Aiken in particular, obviously we're all products of our time to some degree, but if you took her and put her in a classroom today, it would be a real struggle. Not least because so many students and parents, frankly, have this idea that education should be a safe space. You should never be challenged. You know, you, 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 don't, you don't go to actually have somebody challenge you or, or tell you that your ideas aren't bad. You go to be affirmed and to have your ideas affirmed. Maybe people don't say it quite like that, but sometimes it's hard not to think that there are all these things that are simply off limits because this has to be a place where you're safe. And Dr. Aiken's classroom was anything but safe. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you, you could not, I could not get away with insulting one of my undergraduates. Not that I would want to, right? <laughs> but, you know, I couldn't call them a dumbhead in class. No. That, like, that just wouldn't work today. And I'm not saying that's the best pedagogical tool, mm -hmm. right? But she, she was one of several faculty uh, who sort of in their own way, I think as you said earlier, made you start to have to develop a thicker skin and to actually have to think before you started reacting mm -hmm. uh, if you wanted them to respect you. Because subsequent to being an undergraduate, I actually had the upper professors and, you know, I... I began to discover that there was real respect uh, for those students who took the challenge and actually tried to think back rather than just react or check out. Sure. Um, and I mean, I, I know I wasn't the only one. I knew a couple. Um, one student in particular of Dr. Aikens who I think fundamentally Took a different. I was a big fan of Richard Nixon, as I recall, um, and they had an amazing dynamic relationship because there was respect there for the kind of way that you could put together an argument that followed certain methodology, and even if at the end of the day you didn't agree on the conclusions, there was a respect for the discourse. Right, and you, that's hard to. It's hard to get that when you're in a safe space where you're not supposed to have anybody pushing back on particular cherished ideas that you might right. hold. Yes, um, I know, Dr. Aiken, I think that's an excellent point, Dave. Um, Dr. Aiken, another, well, Dr. Aiken was, you know, legendary for throwing students out of her class, but not yes. for disagreeing with her. Of course not. Um, right, right. And I disagreed with her too, and, and some of our, you know, friends, as you mentioned, also did, but for, not being serious, being flippant, being casual with the material. Um, uh, right. It wasn't so, she wasn't, she wasn't primarily interested in conclusions. Or, right. She was interested in a way of being, uh, shall we say. A kind of, um, yeah, I, I don't want to call it like almost like a habit of the heart, so to speak, but, but a habit of respect to what we were about. Um, yeah that was really formative. And you've mentioned Dr. Hoffecker, and um, we don't have a lot of time remaining, but I want to, but Humanities 201 was yeah. I, for another, I, another crucial class for us. Dr. Hoffecker taught this class. It was basically like the history of philosophy. And what was so mesmerizing about this class was that it wasn't, I mean, again, this a similar theme. It wasn't for Dr. Hoffecker about his particular opinions on Plato or Aristotle or uh, 
Descartes or whoever. It was about trying to showcase the thought of these people. And he would spend the yeah. first half hour or so of the, a 45 minute class, like speaking in the voice of this person. And I remember thinking, I, I can't remember. I think we probably started with the pre-Socratics, but I remember thinking, well, he talked about Plato. Well, Plato, that must be right. I mean, that's obviously very <laughs> convincing. But then, you yeah. know, a few days later, it would be Aristotle. It's like, no, wait a second. Aristotle was right, not Plato. Like, what do I do? Like, I had never been taught in that way before. Um, and again, initially very kind of disconcerting, but ultimately really, yeah. uh, really invigorating. What are your remembrances of Dr. Hoffecker in that class? <clears throat> yeah, similar. Um, I was so taken by that course that I actually added philosophy as a, secondary, as a second major uh, in my undergraduate. Um, so I did history and philosophy. And the philosophy side really came out of the 201 course where I was just entranced by all these different thinkers and their different views. And you're right, Hoffecker really tried to present fairly what they were saying on their own terms, mm -hmm. rather than just, as it were, do apologetics, mm -hmm. where you constantly feel like you have to defend yourself against somebody else's view. Um, and he had critical things to say, but that's not where he started. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it was huge, hugely influential because I fell in love with philosophy uh, on the basis of that course. And that I found has, has continued to be an important aspect of the work I do now, simply because philosophical argumentation often has such rigorous methodology behind it. And, try, and, and forces you not just to look at a text, but to try and think about the logic of the argument within that text. Um, yeah, so hugely influential. And I will say too that Hoffecker for me personally um, was a key figure in helping me take my Christian faith seriously, even in the midst of lots of competing points of view. Yeah. Um, and, and it was as much about his example mm -hmm. because he didn't just dismiss or he certainly didn't make fun of um, views that he didn't agree with. He took them seriously and sometimes taking them so seriously that what you had at the end were not answers in response, but interesting questions to reflect on and yet still could come back to this core identity of being a Christian believer. Yeah. Um, that was hugely yeah. helpful. Absolutely. You know, and I think this is worthy of some comment, um, Dave. I'd be curious for your thoughts. Uh, I think both of us, well, uh, at that time, I guess I took that class first semester of my sophomore year. I imagine you did as well. Um, yes. Uh, you had been at that point a Christian, you know, longer than I had. Um, I was still a fairly young Christian. And some might think that that philosophical exploration, again, might be potentially damaging. And I guess it could be it would handled perhaps in a different way. I think we both of us found that enormously strengthening to our faith. Um, yeah. Can you comment on the role of philosophy in building, of course, it's not for everyone, not everyone has to do this, but um, how that can be beneficial to strengthening one's, you know, one's walk with Christ, uh, its benefit towards discipleship? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, a number of things come to mind. Uh, so th this might be a bit more sort of scattershot, but um, I think taking philosophy seriously allows you to think hard about certain basic premises that are starting points for all the ways that we reason and that some of these premises are not the kinds of things that you can as it were scientifically test um, but they actually form where you can go with rational thought so i mean just take something like does god exist or not there is no way either to prove or disprove by scientific means that claim and I think sometimes what can happen is that Christians who 
take a much more defensive posture towards someone who comes and says God does not exist and then lays out all this scientific evidence for why, say, the account in Genesis could not have happened exactly the way the account in Genesis lays it out, uh, is not really dealing with the root issue, right? Because philosophically, the root issue is why is there anything at all? Right, yes, exactly. Instead of nothing. Instead of nothing. And how yeah. does something, if there is something, so why right. does something, why is something here? How is it here? Yeah. Exactly. And science cannot answer that question in, on its own terms, right? And faith cannot answer that question in a way that science would recognize as valid because you can test it. But the fact is, an atheist or someone who believes in naturalism simply has to accept on faith that, well, like we're both fans of the band Rush, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Why are we here? Because we're here, roll the bones. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's about as good as a naturalist can get. Mm -hmm. And philosophy teaches you to actually take those premises seriously, to recognize them. Whereas sometimes I think uh, both Christians and non-Christians can go through rational arguments without ever really seeing the significance of the premise underneath them. And in some sense, faith stands under all that reasoning. Faith that we are here because we're here, there is no God. That's not a statement of scientific fact. That's a belief. And faith that we're here because there is a God. That's a statement of belief. And those statements will then shape the way that you engage with evidence as it comes uh, into the larger way that you look at the world. Um, Hoffaker, again, was really big on this idea of having a worldview. Uh, and I think, I think he's, that's right, that there are so many premises that we accept that then help us interpret the world. And Christians don't need to be defensive about the fact that one of the premises we accept is that we are here because there is a God who created us. That stands in a sense at the same level as the naturalist who says, we're here because well, we're here. Well, just because. Uh, yeah. I mean, but both of these are starting points or premises that allow us then to engage with a lot of other things that we face in the world. Yeah. So yeah. I think philosophy yeah. is hugely helpful for helping us take seriously the premises that we accept. And I mean, you could become a nihilist, right? I mean, you could go sort of Nietzsche and route here and just say, well, we make it all up. Um, yeah. There are lots of ways you can go with that, but recognizing that you're starting with a premise and that that premise is significant for how you interpret everything you experience um, is one of the great things that philosophy can give. And then, sorry, just to add on to that, it's a way then of recognizing that your position as a believer in God is not so radically different from the position of someone who thinks there is no God when it comes to the fact that we're both working with essential premises that I cannot test scientifically either way and come up with some sort of um, experiment that demonstrates once and for all the proof of the premise. Right. Yeah. That's, uh, I think that's very well said, um, uh, Dr. Moffat, Dave. Um, you know, as we wrap up here, um, what kind of, of advice would you give to parents who may be watching this, to students who may be watching this, what kind of education should they seek, um, you know, moving forward? Well, what kind of education should they seek um, in order to, shall we say, maximize their chances at being a follower, uh, like helping the, all right, I'm rambling too. And I talk for a living, and I'm not doing a good job of it now. How, what kind of educational choices should people make to better give themselves the best chance they can to put themselves in the best position um, to further their discipleship? I think that that's um, it's a tough question, Dave, because 
if, if we take the idea that, that education is not a safe space, Mm-hmm. that it is a space where you're you're open to actually trying and and i think i think it's not at all wrong to think in virtue terms here mm-hmm. where you're trying to actually charitably engage with someone who is other than you and you're trying to actually charitably think through um how they see the world and give them at least as a starting point the benefit of the doubt that they are also rational uh and not you know, just completely psychotic or out of touch with reality. Um, there's always there's always the possibility that you might find yourself persuaded mm-hmm. uh, as as you go through that process. Um, so I I don't know that there is going to to a, a university or a college where you're going to be engaging with the ideas of others uh, is not necessarily going to be the best way to encourage your spiritual walk at every point. Mm-hmm. I, I, I would suggest that maybe more important is maintaining certain disciplines, mm-hmm. uh, spiritual disciplines, um, thinking hard about the friends that you're associating with and uh, really finding friends with whom you can talk openly about these things um, who are themselves going to push back, but also themselves are going to care about you and not just be interested in trying to change your views. If you're coming as a Christian, Um, I think those friendships are hugely important as you go through the process of education. Having said that, I do think that there are thinkers who can be hugely helpful uh, for giving you some critical perspective on the views of others as you're trying to charitably engage with them. I think we've already mentioned uh, C.S. Lewis um, as a major figure, every bit uh, an academic, um, who, who wrote a quite a bit of helpful work just saying what if we turn this argument around and think about it from a christian perspective Mm -hmm. Uh, and that that's a sort of way of balancing as it were if if you're facing a good bit of critical pushback it's a way of balancing the critical pushback and saying hang on a minute there are lots of other people lewis is just one example who have thought long and hard about these issues um as I was saying about Hoffaker for me personally, who still come to the to view that what they believe is the the truth, mm-hmm. that Jesus mm-hmm. is the truth. Um, so it's helpful in the process of of having this uh, liberal uh, arts education. It's helpful to to remember that if you're facing voices who are really going after Christian perspectives, they're not the only voices. There are other voices as well. And try to try to engage in the broader dialogue. Yeah, for me, I think maybe the advice I might give is whether you go to maybe a Christian liberal arts college or whether you go to a big state university, um, look for professors who... Um, who will teach you, right, right, who respect the process, who aren't interested in um, indoctrinating you, per se, but who treat you with respect and who treat the pursuit of truth with respect. Um, even if there may be some disagreements um, as to exactly, you know, maybe what that truth is, but, but I think, yeah, look for institutions or at least professors geared towards that common pursuit. Um, I think you and I grew a great deal in that kind of environment. Um, And I think, again, it doesn't have to be the same kind of environment. I think that kind of strategy will pay off really well um, for anybody, you know, seeking a good education. And, and, you know, good, and, and good, shall we say, exercise for their faith in Christ. I agree. Um, the Christian tradition 
sometimes has set itself over against rigorous mm -hmm. uh, academic thought. But there are people like Augustine uh, at the very heart of the Christian tradition who argued that faith needs to be seeking understanding. And insofar as you are able to find those professors who are not going to, they, they may have strongly held views, but who are, as we've been saying with Dr. Aiken, for example, who are going to respect actual rigorous, rational methodological dialogue within a discipline. Um, yeah, that's, that's, um, uh, it's hard to beat, uh, that kind of an education for allowing you to, or for preparing you to be able to think yourself. I mean, something we haven't really touched on in this conversation is I, I think as a Christian, we need to be open to approaching scripture with that same sort of perspective. That is to say, if I believe that God's word, that God speaks to his people through scripture, then more than anything else, I want to hear his voice rather than just react against or parrot back, mm -hmm. echo back my own dearly held views before I started reading scripture. Right. right? So, right. so there are ways in which that, those, the approach that you were talking about um, can be beneficial um, for reading our own scriptures and, you know, for thinking about those who have the task of preaching or teaching those scriptures, because not everyone who teaches them does an equally good job mm -hmm. uh, actually allowing the voice of those texts to speak. Uh, sometimes we put our own theology or our own particular mm -hmm. view over that text and, and actually make the Bible a safe book. Right. When it's not. <laughs> Dr. Moffat, that's uh, wise words. Thank you so much for your time. Unfortunately, we're going to have to end our conversation, but I've yeah. so enjoyed getting to see you again, and blessings to you and your family over in Scotland. And yeah, um, thanks. thanks again so much for joining us and for donating your time. Yeah, my pleasure. And say hi to your family, and it's great to catch up a bit. Thank you again, Dr. Moffat, and thank you again, everyone, for tuning in for this other episode. I hope you enjoyed uh, Dr. Moffat's company as much as I have these past uh, 25 years or so. Thank you again, Dr. Moffat. Yep. Cheers. Bye-bye, everyone.